So this is uh, the invention of Santa Claus, primarily by this very famous American cartoonist, political cartoonist by the name of Thomas Nast. He worked for Harper's Bazaar and he actually began his career back in the early 1860s. Um, he was born in Bavaria, but his family moved to America when he was but a child. So he's often described as German American. And that may be, again, one of the reasons why um, Harper's basically encouraged him to create these Christmas cartoons. So he did about 33 Christmas cartoons over quite a long period, from about 1863 uh, to 1888, which is when he stopped working for Harper's. And Harper's was a very large conglomeration of American magazines. So it's Harper's Bazaar, which is still with us, Harper's Weekly and Harper's Monthly. So you can imagine that they were in need of a lot of illustrations. So the rather lovely um, cartoon on the left-hand side is Thomas Nast's final Santa Claus, if I could put it that way. He's now fully evolved and that dates to 1888. And on the other side, you can see an even more famous uh, Santa Claus, courtesy of Coca-Cola. But you can basically see how the elements that Thomas Nast comes up with are then replicated and have stayed with us, really making our traditional Santa Claus, who is essentially, I'm afraid, an American invention. But all of this links to the fact that New York is originally Dutch, the new colony and that eventually we buy it. So this is one of the reasons why New York has such very strong European Christmas traditions because of the immigrants going into New York from the Netherlands and also later on coming in, thanks to the um, year of revolution, 1848, religious persecution, you get a lot of non-conformists emigrating to America in the 19th century. So this may be the reason why, of all the American cities, perhaps New York is the most European in its outlook. So given that there is this strong Dutch element in New York, this may be the reason why Santa Claus really takes off there. So this is the first sort of tale that we have that sort of brings our night before Christmas elements together. So old Santa Claus with much delight, 1821. So it just predates to us the night before Christmas. It's the first illustrated book to have Santa's reindeer because we've now got him coming from the far north. It will be Nast that will actually put him in the North Pole. And the first to describe his arrival on Christmas Eve, because traditionally, remember, Santa Claus is St. Nicholas. So traditionally, he would arrive on the 6th of December, which is his Saint's Day. Washington Irving, who I also have a soft spot for, uh, again, may not be a name familiar to you unless you're really into things like Sleepy Hollow. That was his, one of his most famous uh, stories, um, ghost story, obviously. And also he was very famous for Tales of the Alhambra. He was one of America's most popular uh, novelists and also writer of short stories. So he comes up with the Knickerbocker's History of New York which again uh, puts in the Santa Claus element. So perhaps most importantly, Washington Irving introduces the theme of smoking a pipe, bringing presents and putting his finger beside his nose in a knowing way, which implies that uh, Santa knows who have been good children and who have been bad children. You know, that's a major element in terms of getting, as you can see on the sleigh here, your rewards. You can also see that Santa Claus, this early on, has, is making that transition from green to red. In the medieval period, if you had a Father Christmas figure, you probably wouldn't be called Santa Claus. That's very much a Dutch name. But we do have in the medieval period here, Lord Christmas, Father Christmas. He's always in green for the evergreen theme. But as you go through the images, you'll see that he goes, Santa Claus, and he goes from being... Uh, green to red, though some of the earliest illustrations are inevitably black and white. So the most famous Christmas poem is said to be by Clement Clark Moore, possibly Henry Livingstone, no relation to our Livingstone, it's an American um, character, but Clement Clark Moore is usually credited with uh, penning the night before Christmas. So you can see here my little elf 
He was a chubby and plump, a right old, a right jolly old elf. And this is the one of the earlier illustrated versions of a visit from St. Nicholas, as it was originally called, 1862. So you can see he was wearing about the pipe and he's putting his finger on his nose to say that he knows who has been a good child and who has been a bad child. And then down below you have the sleigh arriving and um, he's soon going to be on the rooftop though that's well actually that comes again with the night before Christmas because of the the actual uh, literary side of it. Uh, so this is still Felix Octavius Carr Darley, I love it, but now he's illustrating Santa Claus, or I should say the night before Christmas, in Harper's New Monthly magazine, which by the way was, was one of their European publications. So this is the sort of stuff that we would have seen in the UK. So he's now on the rooftop, he's now going down a chimney. Why would Santa go down a chimney? Well, there'd be lots of again, erroneous ideas uh, to do with the fact that you lit bonfires because originally the 6th of December, which is St. Nicholas's Day, was New Year. We've, had, we've moved New Year forward. New Year was when all the animals were slaughtered. And then because we had better fodder and better conditions for keeping animals, New Year moved forward until as it is now the 1st of January. But there was a long, at one time New Year was in November, and then it moved to, to traditionally the 6th of December, and now it's moved to the 1st of January. That's what I thought was quite an interesting sort of Christmas quiz um, question. Uh, the night before Christmas also introduces all of the reindeer and gives them names. They were originally a little more Germanic sounding, as in Jund Dunder and Blixen, um, but they become Donna and Blitzen uh, eventually. Um, after a couple of reprints. So we've got them here in black and white and then down the bottom, a later edition of The Night Before Christmas. So it's originally called A Visit from St Nicholas, but it soon comes to be known as The Night Before Christmas. And again, traditionally, Santa did not come the night before Christmas. It's all shifted uh, to the Christ Christmas Eve experience, again, thanks to our American cousins. Rudolph is much later. So I thought you would uh, be amused to know that he's invented by a department store, Montgomery Ward, not the actor, but the department store. And Gene Autry sang it. It was number one Christmas hit of 1949, selling 2.5 million copies. And originally it was a colouring book, as you can see. So here is 1864, uh, Visit from St Nicholas. I don't know who illustrated this. But you can see here that St. Nicholas is still very much in a brown bear's suit. He's coming down the chimney. And uh, most importantly, when Thomas Nast comes along, you can actually see him developing now into the Santa Claus we've come to expect. He's much more jovial and rotund. He has the pipe. But as you'll see as we go through, the brown bear suit, which is what he's originally in, becomes, as cartoons are developed or the drawings are developed, he becomes more overtly red. Uh, so here we've got a visit of St. Nicholas, illustrated by Thomas Nast, and a children's book, obviously, very much designed for children, not for adults, though I dare say it was adults who read it. And you've got him coming down the chimney, and when he comes down the chimney, of course, um, he, what he's <laughs> hopefully he's not going to meet the child. I do love this banging up the Christmas stocking. I, again, the Christmas stocking probably comes from the fact that in the Low Countries in the 17th century, presents were put in shoes. All I can say is they must have been quite big shoes. But in those days, what you got was an orange, or if you've been a bad child, a piece of coal. So obviously that could be accommodated by a shoe. But anyway, here we are hanging up our stockings and you can see the refrain, "'Twas the night before Christmas, a chance to test Santa Claus's generosity." I love it. So I couldn't resist showing you a typical American decorative ensemble round a fireplace, because as you know, the Americans do tend to go overboard in Christmas, up for Christmas, even in California. And there we've got Nast, and I'm showing you here um, an 1870s rendering of Santa Claus, courtesy of Nast, with his little brown bear suit on, and then the more rotund and becoming distinctly red Santa Claus, which is um, just a few years, well, in fact, not that many years later, this is early 
uh, 70s. So why did Nast, who was, is best known as a critical cartoonist, a vicious one, on one occasion as well, he brought down a very corrupt uh, senator by the name of Tweed, uh, simply through his cartoons. He will eventually be recognized as helping to win the war uh, for the unions. He was an abolitionist. Anyway, the reason why he gets involved with Santa Claus is the Civil War. So here we are in 1862, and Nass decides to use Santa Claus really as um, a way of bringing everybody together. And this is where I first heard the word furlough, because you were furloughed from the army and allowed to go home. But here, of course, our soldier is on the front. He's looking at a photograph of his wife. We have the wife looking up at the moon with her two children. But if you look up into the corners, we've got uh, Santa Claus going down the chimney on one side, and on the other, we've got him riding off on his sleigh. And here's a close up so you can perhaps see it better. So Santa's going down the chimney on one side, and the sleigh is flying off on the other. If you go back to the main cartoon, here's a battle on this side, here's the sea battle. And then there's the cemetery in the center. So this was a big hit with the public, believe it or not, um, Christmas 1862. And uh, following on from that, Nast was sort of given a permanent slot with Harper's to produce these Christmas cartoons, as I say, somewhere around about 30. So this is the one for 1865, Santa's in the middle, and then we've got um, a boy, as a unionist, of course, blowing his bugle on one side, the little girl and her doll. We've got dancing around the fire. And I cannot tell you what's going on in the pantomime down the bottom, uh, except there's a big union sign over them. Uh, but obviously it's to do with Ulysses, the giant killer, as in Ulysses Grant. So even that's politicised. One of the interesting things about that is even when he's drawing Santa Claus, um, he becomes a polit politicised figure beside in the north, as it were, rather than the south. So then 1866, this is when it really kicks in. The war is now over and Santa starts to get his backstory. So this is Santa Claus and his works. Um, it was originally a cartoon, but then it's turned into a children's books. This is where we get Santa Claus film. We get the workshop. We get um, a lovely idea of toys growing on trees that's down the bottom this is him in his workshop he's looking out with his um, telescope for good and bad children there's a big book over here for account book good and bad behavior this is santa having a holiday uh, sewing dolly's clothing so all of the sort of things that we've got used to like the workshop and the north pole as in the aurora borealis so it is louise and they alcock who adds in the elves you'll be pleased to know here it is in colour. And you can see he's still in his brown bear suit. I do love his slippers. And this is uh, then transformed into a children's book, uh, a very bad poem, well, it's more like a prose poem, is written by George B. Webster about Santa Claus and his work. Here he is on the front cover, sewing Dolly's clothing. Also on the in colour, we've got him uh, coming down the chimney with his sack of toys. And then from the 1869 edition, you can see him here, still in his little bear suit, little brown bear, uh, toys on his back. He's got his sleighs going down the chimney. And then again, flying off um, at the end of the story. And then it's really fascinating to see how quickly Nass develops his Santa Claus character. So the, the last one is December 1866. By that stage, Nass his style has been, he's been doing it for over 20 years. His style is now beginning to look dated. There are more cartoonists coming um, to prominence. Uh, he may have fallen out with the management. That happens very frequently. And rather like Mark Twain, he gets into financial problems towards the end of his life. Uh, he will end up as ambassador to Ecuador in the opening years of the new century. Well, I am rather mortified to tell you he contracted yellow fever and died. Um, every good turn, obviously, punished. Um, he was really short of money, and so they'd given him this job to try and help him out. So here we have two children looking for the North Pole because they need to know where to send their letters. 
here is uh, Santa Claus going through all the letters. And do you love the pile of naughty children? Letters from naughty children's parents. I just love that. Sorry, I just think it's brilliant. And then letters from good children's parents. And then there are two pictures in the background. Naughty children hitting each other and good children. I just sort of love the whole thing. Anyway, writing letters is soon, I'm afraid, overtaken by phoning Santa to ask what you would like for Christmas. And this is a, this is a postcard, in fact, a Christmas card from the period of Santa overwhelmed uh, with phone calls from children asking what they would like for Christmas. So here you can see that from sort of the, that sort of late 1860s image, this is one of the images for, from Santa Claus and his work. So 1869-70 to the final image of 1881. All his choice, but if you look carefully, there's still some political messages going on here. He's got US very clearly on that band over his arm. And that band over his arm is actually a belt holding a sword. Again, a reference to who won in the Civil War. So it's quite interesting that even here he's sneaking in the Unionists, their triumph in the Civil War. Anyway, the last little bit then. It is the night before Christmas. I thought we might do a little rendering, not quite. This is, uh, I don't know who illustrated this, but they are my favorite um, images to the night before Christmas from the 1890s. Uh, he was a chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. He certainly has become that now, and he's fully in red. So it was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in the hopes that St Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds. And in fact, I'm showing you again, mother helping to hang up the stockings. And there are lots of renderings at the end of the 19th century. The one at the top is by a very important publisher by the name of Raphael Tuck. This is where it becomes quite personal because even when my daughter was grown up, and moved to France and lived there for six months. That's an element of envy going on there because I would like to have lived in France for six months. But even when she was there, Scott used to have to Skype her in those days to give his rendering of the night before Christmas. It was a really big thing in the, in the Anderson household. So here they all are, uh, fast asleep. Uh, with Santa bringing them their toys, and then the last page, and giving a nod up the chimney he rose, he sprang to his sleigh, his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle, but I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. I'm sorry, just love the sentiment. So, last slide is Haddon Sudblom's Santa Claus. Uh, again, always been a bit of a joke in my family, because, you know, the famous adverts that uh, Coca-Cola has produced over the Christmas uh, season. So as you can see here, these are paintings. Here are the elves. So that's thanks to Louisa May Alcock. And there he is in his workshop. He, he's kept going uh, with his Coca-Cola. And so there we are a little animation to finish at the end.